I'm uh, Konstantin Richter. I'm the sort of MC host uh, of the night. Uh, I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Block Daemon. Um, and uh, we're here today with a fairly eclectic group of people who have uh, a lot of experience in uh, cloud computation, formation, blockchain, infrastructure, protocol management, et cetera, et cetera. And really the purpose of today is to talk a little bit more about um, the current um, state of blockchain, the infrastructure challenges, and the tooling uh, that is available to actually you know, build real things. And one of the things we've tried to do is to uh, blend uh, some people who have a lot of experience in building cloud uh, solutions uh, with people who build amazing uh, blockchain technology. And so uh, we at BlockDemon, and maybe also just a quick introduction, um, I don't want to shill our services, but we're a venture-backed uh, company. We're um, described ourselves as the Heroku for blockchain. If you know what Heroku is, uh, you're in the right room. This is a software-centric discussion, but it's a <laughs> cloud configuration uh, tool. And uh, Heavybit actually was started by the founder of Heroku, uh, who's also an investor, and we're part of the Heavybit uh, uh, developer community and accelerator. And so this is why we're here today. Um, we've also had a couple of interesting announcements today as Block Daemon. We've uh, launched our Stella uh, deployment, which went live today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, as well as Quorum, but we're very happy to have uh, Jed here. Um, and so he's, uh, you know, the founder of Stella and a few other things. And so um, I'm quickly going to, you know, so everybody gets a chance to introduce themselves, but I want to say a couple of words about everyone. So Jed is uh, one of the people that, uh, you know, inspired me a lot as a, you know, true developer who... Uh, probably is one of the uh, most uh, influential people in the space that you know the least about. Um, he, uh, uh, you know, started and founded Ripple. He worked with Mt. Gox. He had a bunch of different experiences and has been in the space for a long time. So we're super happy to have him here. Uh, to my left, Brian, who is the executive director of Hyperledger, uh, you know, a man who has a lustrous uh, background in the open source community uh, with Apache and a bunch of other uh, very exciting projects. I've uh, been a VC. Uh, you know, has uh, been in the space uh, for a long time. And then at the end, uh, uh, Jesse Robbins, the myth, the man, the legend. <laughs> oh, no. uh, anyway, but Jesse is a partner at Heavybit, they're investors. So. Um, and so uh, Jesse is uh, also <laughs> the founder of Chef. Um, he uh, was instrumental in actually setting up the AWS cloud infrastructure business, as well as a bunch of other things. And Jake here is uh, uh, one of the lead engineers at a small blockchain startup called Coinbase. Um, they're um, doing pretty well. And so, uh, you know, the reason why he's here is because these guys actually have to manage infrastructure and nodes where, you know, if things don't work, shit breaks, you know, that's... Uh, and so I kind of um, feel we have a good section here. I, I don't want to... Um, this isn't too, like, kind of sort of scripted, so the goal is to have a sort of a little bit of a, you know, I, I want to start sort of reminiscing a little bit about the open source sort of community and how you all guys started, uh, uh, you know, becoming uh, developers and engineers in the space and... and uh, what got you excited about really open source systems. Um, and so maybe we start that way and we go just sort of down the line while you introduce yourself. So say what you, who you are, um, if I've missed anything substantial, and, uh, and then talk a little bit about what inspired you about open source and, and, and you know, what you currently do in blockchain, and then we'll riff on that. Sure. So uh, once again, Brian Bellendorf, uh, Executive Director of Hyperledger. I kind of call myself the nerd diplomat, though, because <laughs> I, I, we kind of, at, at Hyperledger, uh, we're part of the Linux Foundation. So our job is to try to pull together two kinds of communities, uh, communities of developers building underlying technology for uh, distributed ledgers and smart contract systems. Uh, the second kind of community are the companies like Blockdaemon, like IBM, like uh, Baidu and Tencent, uh, like all these startups around the world who are building and want to build products and services on top of these technologies or just incorporated into their products. Um, and so uh, that, you know, the Linux Foundation has kind of pioneered a certain model about around how to get uh, kind of companies to work together uh, as kind of a, a, a consortium, if you will, uh, not so much a charity, uh, but recognizing the fact that most open source development actually is done by people working for a living, like working to fix a bug or to add a feature for their employer. Um, and how do you really harness that? How do you channel it? How do you try to keep the amount of um, unnecessary disputes between the companies or between developers to a minimum, right? By kind of providing air traffic control. Um, I don't actually employ any developers, nor do I write any open source code these days, and the world is much better off for that. Um, <laughs> but I got into it when um, I was, uh, 
<laughs> Did you got, got, I got onto the internet in 1991 as a freshman at UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, I, it was amazing to me that this thing had been uh, built, this internet, it felt like a secret universe, right? You know, this portal to a place where you could send messages to other people on the, uh, to people on the other side of the planet for free, right? You could access FTP sites or talk to people over IRC. Uh, or uh, read Usenet or mailing lists, right? Uh, all of this uh, seeming to, uh, infrastructure seeming to have emerged out of, out of what? Out of people writing protocols and white papers and, and uh, uh, standards, but not only writing the standards, but writing and giving away software that implemented those standards, right? Uh, and it was software you could inspect. You could like crawl inside and see how it worked. And if, if you tried running it yourself, and I quickly got a job as a sysadmin for the uh, uh, business school at Berkeley, like, again, just kind of goofing off, but it gave me a chance to like crawl inside this code. And when you find a bug and you, if you can come up with a fix, maybe submit it, maybe it's the right fix, maybe it's completely the wrong fix, but it yeah. provokes somebody else into actually doing the right fix, right? Yeah. Um, and so that culture of, of people sharing code long before the term open source was invented, which was roughly 1998, um, long before Apache got started, which uh, I kind of fell into again because it felt like we were continuing this tradition of people working together to build common technologies. Um, uh, long before all that, this is how we got internet software. And, mm -hmm. and I dare say it probably preceded uh, proprietary software in the earliest days of how people kind of figured out how to make computers do what they needed. Um, uh, and so continuing that tradition, when um, the web started to grow up, there were a bunch of us running websites uh, uh, built on top of the pre-existing NCSA server. This was the same team of uh, student intern developers working at the uh, University of Illinois who built the Mosaic browser, some of whom went off to start, I don't know, VC firms like uh, Andreessen Horowitz, right? Um, uh, but the server side of that, the students all left. We, uh, all of us using that software got a note one day that said, good news, all these students went off and, and got a job at this new startup company called Netscape. And we were like, congrats, <laughs> but we're still using this old software. Um, um, uh, and so because we had been exchanging patches with each other anyways, we just decided to keep doing that and called ourselves Apache and, and eventually started a nonprofit around it. But that was, it was, felt like the most natural thing in the world. It's like you riding a bicycle and you just keep riding that bicycle. So, yeah. How many people in this room uh, have contributed to or, or built a product on an Apache licensed product? Okay. Um, pretty, and Almost all of you, regardless of whether you use a Mac or the internet or pretty much any, or an, an Apple product or a Google product depend on uh, the fact that Apa the Apache Software Foundation exists, produced uh, a license model that allowed us to write and share code freely to deal with issues like patents and other things. All really hard and complicated, now solved problems, at least uh, in one general category. Um, and it's interesting because um, the history that Brian just shared um, is often lost when, uh, when you think about like how things get built now, how easy it is to build things now. We depend on a foundation uh, that, that many men and women built and that uh, they built uh, over a period of many years that came from the same energy that's starting to bring you into this room. And I'll give due credit to the Free Software Foundation, which actually started in 84, mm -hmm. 85, something like that. So that also helped lay a lot of the, the, the tracks that we were able to drive on. But uh, I think with w right around when Apache got started in 95, there was this recognition. It wasn't about charity necessarily. It wasn't even necessarily about ideology, about the world has to be free software. It was instead a very pragmatic sense that by you know, this underlying infrastructure stuff we all have to use that um, hopefully we can all have the luxury of ignoring. Um, you know, you don't have worry about the plumbing in this uh, building, for example, right? Maybe we should, I don't know. But, uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but no, fine. you don't have to it's worry fine. about it because <laughs> like, like somebody else is dealing with it. Well, software is, some software is infrastructural, some software is in your face. The more uh, underlying infrastructure software we can develop as communities, uh, the more time and money we can all spend on the truly differentiating stuff. Now it gets lost sometimes in the world of ICOs and the world of everyone building like really bespoke um, blockchain infrastructures that there's a lot of commonality between these technologies and we should be working more. And so that's, that's kind of what Hyperledger really at the end of the day is about. Jake, hey. you want to say hi? And, uh... Yeah, I'll try to follow that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with the internet. Um, <laughs> and you use Apache-based softwares, among other things, I imagine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and so, yeah, my first sort of uh, foray into sort of open source was when I had started doing Rails development. Um, and the fact that this sort of framework existed in this space, and it was, you know, open source, and you could see what's going on, and you could see just this huge community around that space, and all the stuff they provided that I could just go in and, and, and use. 
Like I, I worked primarily in consulting before uh, joining Coinbase, and so I've worked with a lot of different companies, and, and most of them that we worked with are using Rails and able to really spin up these things very fast and have all these features they want really easily by just adding this gem here and there and being able to do that. And then um, it's just a really, really cool thing, and that's what got me interested in it. And then from there, um, sort of my first like open source contributions that have, I think, some, some value um, was with actually the Ember CLI project. Mm -hmm. And so there was a really cool thing that happened there where I was just working on Ember JS applications, and I was building this thing to integrate with this thing called Cordova, which I think was Apache, right? Or is now. Um, and so we were using, Cord uh, we were using Cordova, and uh, we needed some tooling that integrated better with Ember CLI. And so I was building this separate library. And then what happened was like Stefan Penner and from the you know, Ethereum core team saw the repo and noticed and said, hey, like, how about you add this as like, an add-on? Or something. How about you like add some hooks in Ember CLI so you can actually do this your, like yourself with the tool chain? And so it was just this like reaching out of him on this repo. He just opened an issue um, that led to being able to actually contribute to Ember CLI and sort of put in the the first steps of this sort of add-on system that they have today. Um, that's a really powerful thing. And so the fact that I was just able to just somebody who worked you know at this small little company in Houston uh, be able to contribute in this big way, and then now this software is used by you know thousands and thousands of people around the world. Um, I think that's really powerful. And the fact that you can see this and that you can learn from it. I think learning was huge. Being able to work with these other developers who knew more than I did and be able to learn and see how they did things, the trade-offs they made, and be able to have those conversations with them. And it just sort of be this community together that pushes sort of the world forward and just shares this software and says, hey, you can use this, and you don't need to worry about this part of it. And you can just build the sort of thing that you want and that your customers need. Great. Cool. Good. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, my, my relation. I, the, the, my, my first big open source projects were definitely in the blockchain space. Prior to that, we would always have this decision like whether we should open source or not. And like the, one of the cool things I like about the blockchain space is there's no, there's no decision. Right? You, you definitely have to, it has to be open source because like Brian has pointed out, it's like this open infrastructure that, that is this kind of this underlying thing and people want to be able to see it and it's used by many, many parties. And so everyone needs to have access to it essentially. And so that's been really great. And one of the other cool things I think uh, that about this space in general is that what you're building is not just software, but it's these, these open platforms. And so it's not just people contributing to the code, but they're contributing to the actual ecosystem. So there's just a, a lot of different players that are involved, uh, you know, contributing all kinds of ways, which has been pretty exciting because it's kind of like you're in a big team, not with your own just organization, but with organizations at large. So that's been pretty inspiring and fun. So, yeah. Cool. Jesse, do you want to? Uh, tell us what, what you know. What what is your your <laughs> role, role in well, the let me, world? Well, uh, let me. So, so I I am motivated by a belief that developer technologies and tools have the power to make a better world. And uh, so, in high school, my start, I became a sysadmin, uh, and I wrote a paper in in high school, which was uh, before open source was a thing. Uh, it was I want to work with a big group of people that are going to make the internet technologies and protocols that for this thing called, quote, the internet. Um, and, uh, and I really described a, a vision for wanting to participate and help build organizations that make things that make things better. Um, my role at Heavybit, I'm one of the part-time partners, so I have the good fortune of now helping other founders and teams uh, avoid many of the, the problems and challenges that I learned as a first-time CEO at Chef, um, and often provide a lot of the experience that um, uh, that comes from building a, a, you know, what is now a big company and having worked on building big infrastructure and other environments. So uh, that's, that's what I do. Um, why I'm hoping that everyone is here is uh, to learn how to embrace the next wave that is coming and either build on, in, around, or uh, contribute to um, a set of tools and platforms that have a potential to change the way and improve lives for the, the next decade. Mm, great. And so, uh, thanks guys. And so maybe one way to um, um, talk a little more about open source is the, the concept of decentralization. And so I'm, uh, I'm curious what that means. So we've got two guys who you know, kind of build protocols that are open source and, and, and are blockchains where the, the word decentralization is supposedly meaning. Um, <laughs> it seems like blockchains either can be built for speed or consensus mechanisms and there's this trade-off in between, so I'm like kind of, sort of curious what you think about the, um, you know, the sharing of infrastructure that's needed in order to actually have um, um, a decentralized network and how important that is for you, um, and uh, and what that means for the security of the network, and then actually I'd be really curious to hear 
uh, Jesse, what you think about you know the the sort of degree to um, how that translates into you know cloud formation and, and that world that we came from. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear about that from uh, both you guys. Brian, if you want to start. I'll start. Sure. Um, what is decentralization? What is decentralization? Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty contentious <laughs> argument now, and there are people who take fairly binary kind of points yeah. of view on this. Oh, you're not decentralized, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, there's a lot of kind of like uh, tribalism. I'm a single point of failure. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, you have a, a lot website. of people. Have, yeah. <laughs> I do think a lot of people have felt that yeah. the last 15 years on the net there's been uh, less decentralization of the internet as a whole, right? Mm. There are f uh, there's fewer places where you can get an email account, mm. uh, fewer places to go get caught up on news or to build, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a group for your family, you know, or to share messages, that sort of mm. thing. Like it feels like a lot of this has started to uh, centralize uh, or fall into a small number of parties, right? And a lot of very um, smart, very active people who for 10 years have been trying to build ways to re-decentralize the net. And I think a lot of people read in Satoshi's original white paper, wow, here's a way that uh, helps counter some of the scale advantages that you get from centralization, right? Because centralized systems actually are incredibly cheap, incredibly scalable. Right. Like we know now, thanks to a lot of the hard work of open source developers, how to build um, central infrastructures to support things at the scale of a Facebook or a Twitter, right? It's actually harder to build more decentralized message systems or decentralized databases, those sorts of things. And so um, uh, in that vein, a lot of people have been trying to ask, how do we tease this apart and build more decentralized systems, right? And I think some of the cryptocurrency community had taken the, the, the perspective of if you go all the way to decentralized and say you know, that the only source of validity in uh, verifying transactions is the proof of amount of CPU time that you've been able to successfully burn on a trivial problem, uh, then that's perhaps the most fair way that we could think of to uh, build a, a, a broad network without anybody uh, in the center. Um, but I think they forget that there's still a governance involved in deciding what software to run on the nodes, what so how that software is built, the debate, for example, in the block size uh, mm -hmm. or in the Ethereum community between bailing out the, the, the DAO hack and mm -hmm. not bailing out the parity hack, mm -hmm. right, um, uh, is, a, is basically a sign that there is still governance at work. Mm -hmm. And I think you can either recognize that up front and have a structure for having decision making inside of a community, or you can try to pretend that it doesn't exist and you end up with Lord of the Flies. And right? how do you do it for Fabric? What's so, the so there's that side of the world. And then there's another side of the blockchain world, which has been about saying, okay, let's say you have a formal recognition for the role of a governing entity in, in, a, in a network, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, it, the metaphor I've been using is it's kind of like having a referee on a football field, mm -hmm. right? Or a soccer field. Um, somebody who uh, uh, basically grants certificates to participants to join a network, and then once you're on the network, you can participate in the consensus, you get a full copy of the ledger that's being created, you can write transactions. Frankly, that note ledger could also be public read, right? Um, but you have these trustworthy nodes that are basically able to submit these transactions to a common pool. Um, I think that's still decentralized if you have the ability to fire the referee if they start making bad calls, right? If the referee uh, you know, can basically make up rules as they go and they can throw yellow flags because they don't like you or they can charge you $100 as a player to get on the field, that's a bad referee and you should be able to fire them. Uh, uh, so I think I, my hope is that we can use blockchain technologies to take a lot of business networks out there that today are very centralized in operation, that where you do have to trust some party at the center who charges a 40% fee for this service, by the way, uh, and they keep all of the systems of accounts clear, and you have to trust them, uh, uh, and they are the ones kind of at the end of the day in the point of authority, um, and instead tease those apart so that we're much more, uh, more decentralized, more um, individual competing players in a field, but still able to play a game and hold that governing entity to check. And I'll end with that's very much like the degree of decentralization you have in the open source community. Mm -hmm. Open source projects, the one defining characteristic of an open source license is something called the right to fork, mm -hmm. which is the right to say, hey, there's, here's a team building code. I disagree with them. I've got a better idea. They might disagree with me. That's fine. I can take this code and go in another direction, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you and I have a dispute, right, we can part ways. And that's actually a way of lowering the risk of, of uh, working together on, uh, on, on a piece of code uh, because it means one of us doesn't have to throw away the investment that we've made. Um, and I think blockchain networks, uh, you'd, certainly the public chains work the same way. That's how we have uh, Bitcoin Classic and uh, Ethereum <laughs> Classic and, and, and all these others, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll see that phenomenon on both the permissioned and the unpermissioned. Jed, I'm curious because you're obviously, uh, you know, you've uh, been instrumental in starting Ripple, 
Uh, Ripple is one of those protocols that gets a lot of stick about is it a blockchain, is it decentralized? Yeah. Um, you've, uh, I think, really took kind of the open source components of Ripple and created Stella that actually was an enhancement of that. Uh, what was the thinking there and what's your view on, on decentralization and what's a blockchain and not? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, obviously there's a spectrum of de decentralization. Right. You know, I don't think it's, there's, it's not binary for sure. There's like, and the, not only is there a spectrum, but there's lots of different axes. You know, there's mm -hmm. like, uh, like are, are the people contributing to the code? Is that a, a set right. group of people? Are the people running the servers? Is that a set group of people? There's like the, the governance, like there's, lot, there's lots of different, um, aspects to it and and you can vary on all of those and it's it's really really hard to be like fully decentralized where i don't even know what it means to have like nobody control the thing like because we're you know there's ultimately at the end of the day there are people running this software it is software right so somebody has to run it mm. um so uh yeah so i mean it's always kind of a trade-off and it also depends on like what your what your goal of your of your system is like it, uh, in many cases decentralization just doesn't even make sense like you're at the end of the day if you're having to trust like like if you want to issue an equity in this decentralized system, at the end of the day, you're trusting some company to redeem that equity and like, and, and like, m turn that equity into something. So there's a party that you're trusting. So does it really make sense for it to be a fully decentralized system? So uh, you know, there's a lot of weirdnesses like that that you see in in the blockchain world where people are actually like trying to make something way more decentralized than it will be at the end of the day. So yeah. Um, and let's see what else to say. Uh, yeah. I mean. Uh, I mean, that's it. I mean, I guess, and then, like, in terms of, like, what's a blockchain, what's not a blockchain, to me, like, what the, the defining characteristic is, is there some, like, public record out there that, that people can see, but, but you can't change arbitrarily, right? So it's, like, it becomes this, like, it becomes essentially this trusted third party what where... What is arbitrarily? Like, what Ethereum, it, it, the DAO hack, like, so, for example, so is that, like, a... Yeah, well, so that's, like, that's, yeah. like, a... That's a problem. So right. yeah, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, what it, what it means is like you know if, if there's some database like like Google's running a database for right. all their email, right? Google can arbitrarily go and change your email, right? They they probably don't, but they have that power, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas it, it, you know with like Bitcoin, n no one can just go arbitrarily change like your balance because because it's it requires all this proof of work and all, all and that there's this chain of hashes, yada yada yada, right? So that's what I mean. Like there's like this public record that people can see, but but there are certain rules for how it gets permutated, right? And once you start varying those rules, uh, th then you kind of deviate from, from what it means to be like this blockchain idea. Right. And I think that's the important characteristic rather than the actual underlying consensus mechanism. So, yeah. yeah. How about Stella? So what was the thinking there in terms of uh, even enhancements around Ripple? Like what was, right. a, it's a foundation, it's a, like there's structurally some more decentralization in the- Yeah, I mean, so the idea is that, uh, I mean, when I first learned about Bitcoin, I was super excited about it. I think it was like, I never thought this was possible to solve this problem before. Uh, but I mean, one of the things that's always bothered me is just like how much, uh, how, mu how wasteful it is. And so I was just trying to think of other ways to solve this consensus problem. And again, make this thing where there is this, this public record that people can see, but you, it's not just arbitrary to change. And so that was kind of the idea is how, how, do you, how, how do you come up with another system that can solve that same problem, but maybe in a more efficient way or, or a way that's tailored for a different kind of different use case. Um, and then along with that is like one, once you realize you have this, there's other, a lot of other problems you can solve besides being just a new internet currency. You can do lots of different things, and which is what Stella's trying to do. So, yeah. yeah, exciting. So Jesse, what do you feel like as a sort of guy who comes from cloud services, enterprise tooling, um, you know, chef, like what, what do you think about all this stuff, these decentralized all open source? All this <laughs> stuff, like in a two or three words. So the internet's built on a, on a distributed system called BGP. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a routing protocol. Mm -hmm. That's how packets find each other. Um, and it's a consensus-oriented model. It requires global scale. It requires also the participation of multi-parties and, act and actors. There's hostile actors from time to time that will change internet routing tables. This is how, uh, how a, you know, a packet gets from point A to point B is a complex thing that it requires humans and machines in the loop doing stuff uh, in order to agree on how we, we send data around. And uh, another version of this is DNS, the way that we find what a host name is that turns into an IP address that routes through the BGP routing tables. Um, and all of these things are, uh, are systems that were born from, the, from uh, a decentralized early model. They have tended towards centralization as uh, I, I find ironically that humans tend to centralize. We are anti-entropic. Um, whereas, uh, whereas you know, the rest of the world tends to uh, you know work the way the rest of the world works. Mm. Uh, so we we seem to be organizing machines. 
Um, there's a couple of things that I, um, over the years, have noticed and, uh, and trends that I see. Um, one thing to know is that I am a firefighter EMT by training. Um, that has been a thing I've done throughout my career. And speaking as a firefighter in this room, I want to talk about some things that have emerged over time. Fire safety issues? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so here we are, and we have assembled in this room. And this is a converted warehouse space. And if you look up above you, you will see that there are sprinklers. And if you look uh, over there, you will see that big red hydrant stand that comes out. Now, that is part of a decentralized fire suppression system that has emerged through a system of codes um, that, that are required for buildings that have p occupancies with a certain type of risk. Now, the fire department did not install this. There is no central insta installation agency for this sprinkler system. This is installed because there are safety codes that have emerged from one thing and one thing only, which is a loss of life. No part of our fire safety code has emerged um, that, and been widely adopted like sprinklers without a significant loss of life um, uh, event that then causes people to go, we need a regulation that says if there's this many people in a space with this type of construction, you gotta have sprinklers, you gotta have exit doors that'll, that work in a particular way. That is a part of how occupancy models work. And as a, as a systems engineer and a person that has built a lot of infrastructure, I have observed over the years and in fact been responsible very early. My, my title at Amazon was Master of Disaster and I owned website availability for every property that bore the Amazon name. So I, I know a little about this stuff. And the, the big thing to understand is that as we start to build these, these models in a distributed mode, um, we see the evolution of a, what Brian described, um, which is you, know, you have groups of people coming together uh, with uh, rough consensus and running code. And over a period of time, we build systems that become things that people depend on. And then every once in a while, we have events that cause a loss. A and the greater the loss, um, the more likely it is that you'll st see calls for regulation. You'll see calls for these other types of changes. So one of the things that I look to is um, thinking about the world often like we think about fire codes. Um, sprinklers are expensive, and that means that buildings that, you know, if you want to open an artist space, for instance, in Oakland, and you want to be hackers who form a collective, and you get together and you build all kind of beautiful artwork and other things, and you do that in a building that doesn't have sprinklers, and then there's a big fire, that results in, in tragedy, right? And so that's why when we go, oh, well, some things need to be regulated, some things need to have uh, safety standards emerge, when you're kind of thinking about it with your hacker mindset, um, you begin to understand that the more people depend on you, the more that people depend on a system working in a particular way, um, the less they can, they can really be responsible for their own safety in depending on that system. Mm -hmm. So what I expect will happen over time is that we will see the emergence of safety standards, safety protocols that become common whether we're using the ledger uh, for storing and sharing data publicly, as you're describing, um, or uh, whether we're using it as part of a financial system or a transactional model. What I believe is that we will see a distributed system emerge very similar to the way that, that BGP routing has um, emerged and standardized, the way that DNS has emerged and standardized. Unfortunately, it is now centralized uh, far more than BGP has. Um, and that as cloud standards and then uh, the blockchain-related uh, standards start to emerge, they will be based around the idea of just simple uh, I concepts like, oh, this is how you can audit, this is how you can see, this is how we can make sure that systems work, that they uh, have minimum uh, understandable risk models that are mapped appropriately to the work and the value that they are doing. If you're staying in a tent, you don't need a sprinkler system, right? You don't need sprinklers when you're camping. You need them when, the, when there's a concentration of risk um, and the people or the things that are exposed to that risk don't have a method of evaluating it for themselves. So that's, what I, that's my, my sort of longitudinal perspective <laughs> hmm. on, uh, on how uh, we will see, uh, see uh, both standardization and centralization uh, occur uh, over a period of time. Right, great. Um, I want to stir us uh, briefly, and we're going to open up for questions, and you know we'll have time to dive into like different subject areas um, that we've touched on. But uh, let's talk briefly uh, a little bit about the current sort of technological performance of the infrastructure and, and where we actually currently are in sort of blockchain land. Um, Jake, we were speaking uh, a little bit about the the you know Coinbase obviously runs nodes. There's a lot of you know stuff happening on Coinbase. 
Um, <laughs> and so I assume. Um, and so, bit. you know, the question is really, uh, you're probably, uh, you know, you probably have the first hand experience of the most, uh, the edge case of running nodes and, and keeping a ledger up to date and running queries and, and, and how does that infrastructure look and, and uh, how much do you lean on centralized tools or, you know, existing developer tools to help with your current uh, infrastructure that, I don't know, do you, do you run a, do you have nodes for each currency that you run? Do you outsource any of that? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. So. Yeah, I mean, we run all our own nodes. Um, we build them from source. We don't rely on external releases. We, you know, check hashes and all that kind of stuff. Um, we use Docker. So mm -hmm. Docker powers basically everything we do. So it's a very, you know, core open source component to our stack and allows us to sort of build these in a really good way and get them, them shipped. Um, for actually the running of the nodes themselves, there is still tooling we have to build on top of just running a node. Like running a node isn't, it can be just downloading a single node and then starting it up and then, you know, letting it sync. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, in our system, you at sometimes need more nodes, at sometimes you need less nodes. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be able to start those up, and you can't wait you know, a week or a day or, or whatever it may take to get the node up. You've got to be able to get nodes up in a reasonable amount of time to be able to handle the sort of increased um, amounts of traffic you may see. Mm -hmm. And so for that, you have to build in these systems that will take you know, the entire database of the node, which like in Ethereum's sort of you know, worst case, to be fair, of this sort of archive node that stores all the state history. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, right now around like 1.2 terabytes or so. Mm -hmm. And so sort of storing that and that shipping that around like your cloud platform uh, for each instance you need to do is a lot of a lot of work. It's a lot of data transfer. It's a lot of storage. That what cloud do you use, by the way? I'm just curious. AWS. AWS. How much do you pay a month? <laughs> it's good, good <laughs> Who knows? Um, probably a lot. I'll give you a tip. Yeah. I'd yeah. say it's a yeah. lot. And uh, yeah. probably, I mean, at least on like the crypto side of things, probably a lot for just transferring backups right. from one to the other. Anytime we spin up a node, it's like, all right, transfer a terabyte over S3 or something. Right. Um, we've got some new things in place to, that we're working on to make that a little bit better. So it's not as uh, just this like raw transfer, but using some like really nice a Amazon features like uh, elastic like block storage, I think EBS stuff, mm -hmm. um, which would be really cool. But that's like a, one of the core things that like delays getting nodes up and getting them available. Um, the second thing that I think is really critical in sort of our world is we want sort of redundancy. We don't just run a single node and expect that to work the whole time because if it doesn't, then that causes problems. People can't send their payments anywhere and they just they can't receive them. There's a lot of problems. So we need redundancy. And for that, OK, you throw a load balancer in front of it. But now all these nodes are completely isolated from each other. They, they may be in different regions. They may be in different uh, AZs. And so because of that, you have this sort of eventual consistency problem. Mm -hmm. And this is a really interesting thing, because we have to take all the data from the blockchain from the nodes and basically process it ourselves, because we have a much bigger set of data to look at. We need to take you know, hundreds of millions of addresses and take a look at those and say, all right, do any of these addresses that this is getting sent to, are they ours? And the nodes aren't built to do that. So we have to sort of do that ourselves. So running queries across that network is, how do you do that? Like, so yeah, so rather than running queries for most things, we actually just kind of pull all the blocks. So right. in the, like all of our nodes right now are all like block-based. So you can take every block, pull out its transactions, and just inspect them ourselves. So we're sort mm -hmm. of doing duplicate work here. Like the mm -hmm. node has already done this and sort of updated its own systems, but we, now we need to take that and pull it into our system because the nodes are not meant to handle hundreds of millions of addresses. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're not built for that. They're not built for our use case. They, they so aren't built for centralization. <laughs> like you are, a central, yeah. you are the central part of a decentralized system. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, but the other side of that is uh, my laptop doesn't have 1.3 terabytes of storage. You to need run. a new laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but you can buy yeah. it on Amazon. Storage will get cheaper, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they got 6T now. Yeah, yeah. no. Um, so that's like a big thing for us is like mm. being able to pull this data and it's all like separate. And they're, yeah, they're not meant to run in these centralized worlds. But I think the future is there's going to be a lot that are running in these worlds. There's going to be a lot of companies that get big and that they need to run these nodes and they need to run them in a way that's efficient. And the, I, I think there will be specialized sort of software for this that's built for this case. And I think we always want to have this sort of base case where you can run it on your laptop, where you can spin up your own thing, when you can take like what y'all are doing and like run it on your own AWS world. Mm. Um, I think that's a really important thing to maintain. But I do think that for this sort of scale, like it just seems inefficient the way that it works in a centralized system and being able to process that and manage that for people. Mm. Yeah, that no, makes sense. And we were talking earlier, we're part of a, um, a Skype group of 100 uh, execs and, uh, and, uh, of exchanges and wallets where you know, we talk exclusively around Ethereum geth nodes not syncing and stuff. And so, not, not, you know, that's not like... How, a, how do I not get added to that group? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll add you. You'll have fun. Uh, it's a, but it's, a, you know, it's fascinating for us as a sort of solution provider in that space to also learn that um, you know, the most uh, 
uh, larger centralized agents obviously don't want to outsource any of that, right? So they, they, they like to maintain the centralization there, and that creates you know, an enormous amount of cost and stuff. How many people work in the infrastructure sort of on that side in Coinbase, you know? Like, I'm just curious. Um, probably Not just you. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's you definitely and your a team. <laughs> I was like, oh. There is yeah. a team. Um, I mean, we have a full infrastructure team dedicated to sort of keeping infrastructure yeah. stuff healthy, SRE team for that kind of stuff. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's mostly the crypto team, which I think is uh, 10 to 15 people or so okay. um, right now. And we kind of keep an eye on that. And um, as we grow, we are sort of figuring out how to sort of reorganize the teams to have like specialized sort of features where, you know, we might have this world where you know we have our sort of internal team for, for spinning up nodes and that we can do that efficiently and they're able to maintain that and provide really good sort of metrics. That's another thing that's, I don't think, uh, ideal in the current state of node software is sort of getting insight into what's happening within the node. Mm. We might see some weird case that seems odd to us. It doesn't match our understanding of what the blockchain is supposed to do or the way, and so we don't really know what's happening. We, we might log data out and we're gonna log things from the nodes, but uh, what the node logs and what they mean aren't usually documented, they don't usually, they might be vague. Um, mm. They also just log straight to standard out, so it doesn't make it as searchable. There's no sort of formatting you can do on, on the software that I've seen, at least the software we run. Um, and so there's a lot there and sort of insight into how the node is performing, what's happening there, sort of metrics and being able to actually have a clear picture because for the most part, it's a black box. Mm. And we, we trust these things to you know, power our entire business, really. Mm. And without knowing that, it makes it harder to run these things and know like when things are wrong and know what's wrong other than you know trying to see like okay it's not seeking blocks mm. why here's some logs uh, mm. <laughs> yeah and we, we, we hope I, somebody can can help out with that I'm, I'm chuckling over here uh, when and as we were uh, getting ready for the panel I was talking to Brian and so basically um, you know the so heavy heavy bit exists to help developers build developer tool sets right and that means that you have to walk through whenever there is a major change in how infrastructure works and the tools that we rely on, um, there's going to be a bunch of technologies that, or companies or both that emerge that have to instrument the entire stack, right? Here you are describing your orchestration layer and like, oh, we use these Docker containers in order to, you know, so that sounds familiar. And we do that on AWS. Oh, okay, that sounds familiar. And then, oh, it's really hard to instrument and understand and inspect what's actually going on. And if only we had, and so what, what's interesting is, is that there's this perfect repetition of, of every cycle that we go through where you know pretty soon there'll be like the splunk for blockchain and the blah for blockchain the, the heroku for right we text uh, splunk too we, yeah. we got a whole list yeah, no, the whole <laughs> thing. yeah. yeah. Um, and so what what's interesting and important um uh so the problems that uh that coinbase has at scale um which um you know are the problems that happen when a platform wins um, are different than the problems that many of you when you're starting and building a first project, or maybe in an entirely different space, are going to face. Um, and the, and so you know the advice that like I can give people and you can give people about operating at large scale systems are interesting. But there's there's this other side of it, which is like um, how do you think about the the space as a whole? So one of the things I'm curious about is kind of as people think about the tool chain, like what are the problems that that you see that, that you can take from systems management and you can apply to decentralized systems management? Like, what is the tool chain that you're looking for? What's, where's the white space where you're like, if only I had blah, I would not have to do, uh, I, would, I would get way more sleep, right? What's, what's, what's waking you up at two o'clock in the morning on your on-call rotation? Oh, uh, Geth. Um, <laughs> Geth currently. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's being a little weird for us. Um, but no, um, I mean, I think the stuff that, that Block Team is doing is pretty cool because, like you mentioned, you know, what if you are, you know, starting some new business and you need, and you're building it on the blockchain and you need nodes? Like, yeah, you can just go manually configure AWS to do something and, like, hope it stays up and hope you don't have to restart and resync the blockchain or, like, change some configuration and get a new version. Um, and you need to auto scale it up. And so you need tooling in place for that. And I, I think, like, y'all are doing stuff to make that better. And there's, I think, there's probably a lot of tooling that can be built to how to automate that sort of solution and to do it for you by just you know wrap your you know process in this thing and it will automatically go take the data deer and like pull that off somewhere else do you build your own metrics uh, do you have your own metric stack or you how do you do your monitoring how do you how, like once you have deployments up uh, yep. how, how do you how do you operate the the platform that you're running yeah these days um, these days most uh, logging and sort of metrics um, logging and all that goes into Kibana Elasticsearch, all that kind yep. of world um, and then uh, we also use Datadog for yep. some specific metrics and, and tracking that. And then we do do some of our own custom 
instrumenting from what we can via like RPCs on these nodes mm. to take them and say, you know, what is the block height so that we can graph that and see, oh, it is like freezing at this period of time. Or, you know, what's the memory usage? What's the disk space? Um, how many, you know, peers does it have? Sort of the information we can pull from the RPCs, we can take out and try and use that to, you know, do some monitoring and alerting and such on top of it. Is, um, is that something that you, you think of as being proprietary to Coinbase? Or is that, and uh, let me know if this is out of scope. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm interested because everyone in this room hopefully will be building technologies that operate at your scale, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a certain amount of operating experience and exposure that, that you, you, you uniquely have in this room. And so the question is, like, do you think that, uh, is that tool chain itself part of kind of the value of building a blockchain business, um, a, a separate from the monetary, uh, like the fact that you're running an exchange the way that you are? Uh, but like, is that, a, is that sort of table stakes or is that something special? I think it's an important thing to build a business unless you want to sort of reinvent the wheel. And I think there's a lot of sort of, a lot of this stuff can be built in sort of an open source world and do it. And I think like we would love to do more open source things as, as, as needed. And it's one of the things that like, yeah, it's, you're going to need it if you want to run your nodes. The other alternative is to like use a company, use Infura to run mm -hmm. your nodes. And I think Ethereum, you know, majority of it's probably powered on Infura. And that's a very centralized entity. And like they haven't done anything bad yet, but they could. And so if you mm -hmm. want this sort of decentralized world, you need to, you know, be able to run your own nodes. And so right now it's really hard. And it's, it's not that easy to do, and it's not easy to do reliably. And like, if your system goes down and you're not tracking that your node's not seeking blocks anymore for some reason, um, that it has no peers, like, nobody's going to tell you that. The nodes don't have things built in to tell you that. So like, you have to track that yourself. And so you can totally build tools on top of this um, mm -hmm. that do that kind of stuff for you and just wrap it all up. And it doesn't have to necessarily live in the node. Um, there are some things like, like the logging kind of stack and all that that I think are something that could be improved um, just to help like, better analysis. Um, of sort of issues when they come up, um, rather than just like rep, raw standard out <laughs> strings. Um, <laughs> right. Logging. That, it's how does this uh, for Stella? What was your thinking there? How have you developed that architecture? How do you what, how do you monitor the yeah. network? And <clears throat> you have an exchange as well um, on Stella, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's built into the network, right. but yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I think a lot of these issues are because the this software is not designed for this use case. It's not designed for to be run at scale, like we were saying before. Mm -hmm. And the, the people that made it was more just like someone's going to put this on their laptop. It's like, it's like a descendant of, of Bitcoin D. Basically, all these, most of these projects are descendants of Bitcoin D. And that's, you know, What's honestly, Bitcoin D? The, the first Bitcoin right. node slash right. client. And it, honestly, it just wasn't really written with uh, this kind of use in mind. Like it's combining the API with the, the validation and all this stuff. Mm. It's just doing all these kind of weird things where it's not like separating the stuff. So. Basically, when we designed Stellar, we, we kind of tried to keep that more in mind. Like, basically, our API server is this whole other piece of software. Uh, you know, Stellar Core just writes out to a database that, that now then the API can, like, access. So it's much more easy to, like, you know, put load balancers in front of it and, like, and, like scale it out. And then we also, like, emit all these metrics Stellar Core does so you can kind of see what's going on, like, what parts are, like, slow and all this kind of stuff. So we, just, we tried to keep uh, the, the, the idea that eventually... You know, it would be cool if everyone runs this on their laptop, but that's just really not the way the internet works. Like, anyone can run a mail server, but in practice, only a few companies do. And I think it'll be the same as true in mm. this new world. We like, all used to run mail servers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. yeah, I, I mean, you were the only one that does. I mean, I did, I did it for a long time, but yeah, now it's just Coming a hassle, back. right? Yeah. Yeah. You and Hillary Clinton. Right. right. Or like, you, know, you, know, or like yeah. you could run your own DNS server, but you don't. Like, you, you let other people do it. So you kind of need to make this, like, your, your core software be able to be run by enterprises, essentially. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. What are you most excited? What's next for Stella? Also, just uh, for us. Like, um, yeah. What are you What are you excited about in it? Like, what's your Where do you spend your day thinking yeah, about technically? Well, we're hiring a bunch right now. That's where I spend my day, unfortunately. Right. But but uh, but basically, for us, like, we're really focused on scaling right now. I mean, I think all of these uh, all of these blockchain technologies, none of them are really none of them could fulfill their total promise yet, right? Like, obviously, there's huge scalability issues with Ethereum right now, and like, we'll eventually hit them. I mean, we have a lot of room to run, but I mean, I think. Uh, None of, like they're all kind of aspiring to be this like global distributed system, and and none of them could really handle that load at this point. So that's like our number one concern is like how to actually make it get there. So that's what we spend mm. most of our time on. We take a kind of a different. Uh, I mean, Hyperledger even before I joined kind of staked its uh, a flag in the, the space that said maybe it's not one giant ledger that everybody kind of lives within and writes transactions mm. to, right? Maybe it's not one global computer, right? Um, Maybe it's actually a patchwork of a lot of different ledgers that exist out there that are fired up easily, right, between a set of parties who realize they have a common set of use cases, 
uh, that uh, uh, might have a one different uh, one ledger might differ quite a bit from the other and choice of technology, but also very prosaic things like how frequently do you upgrade, right? You might mm -hmm. have one set of customers and one set of applications where they want just ultimate stability. They don't want things to change, you know, more than once a year mm -hmm. and be heavily tested. Others who want to update every week when there's a new release, right? Um, one who wants full uh, uh, Turing complete programmable environment for their smart contracts. Others who say, no, there's just three kinds of contracts to have on here and we'll audit the, uh, the, the uh, code to that, you know, thoroughly and we'll just lock those down, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this idea, I would wager, is actually more decentralized than a notion that says everybody's on one set of rails. And I think it's, you kind of do need that when you want payments, because you want payments to have as large an audience as possible and be as portable as possible. Uh, but uh, So you really do want things that operate at the scale of, of, of a Bitcoin, Ethereum, a Stellar, those sorts of things. Uh, but for a lot of these kinds of other uh, applications out there for blockchain technology and supply chains in um, uh, in healthcare, in uh, all sorts of bespoke financial markets, mm -hmm. like, it's perfectly fine to have a blockchain comprised of 20 to 100 nodes, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, processing a couple of hundred transactions per second. Uh, that's the, ma the vast majority of use cases out there would be more than satisfied by those. As long as you have ways to tie transactions across ledgers, mm -hmm. to do discovery of which ledgers are out there. Mm -hmm. And I'd say as long as it's always easy for that 21st bank to join a network, for mm -hmm. that 101st uh, healthcare organization to join a network. Um, so there's, there's a mix of tech and politics in those kinds of like questions. Uh, but I think we're going to end up with most of the blockchain world looking like these kinds of easy to spin up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more manageably sized uh, kind of blockchain networks that might have lifespans. You know, they might mm -hmm. even be rolled up at the end in some net settlement and become basically a, a historic thing and then restart it again, partly to address some of these scalability concerns. Great. Well, let's uh, roll this panel up. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I do want to open it up for questions. So you mean a database? Right, <laughs> like, like what we have is like I'm a I'm a I'm a, a Fortune 500 company, and what I want to do is like write some data and do some work on data and have that have high integrity and trust. But it's, it's a database. Well, to a shared ledger, <laughs> right? So that there'll be clients that run on each of these different uh, uh, you know companies that are on a shared ledger. Yeah. The interface between that and the rest of the organization will be web services interfaces. It'll be local SDKs. It'll be stuff that's familiar to the, the communities there. There'll still be an integration challenge. And I think the biggest question is migration. Because you're actually, to, for any of these blockchains to be useful, they have to become the system of record. Right? They can't be an echo of a transaction record happening in some other mm. system. They have to, if there's a dispute, they have to be the final, the final like arbiter, right? Uh, and so migrating t from a bespoke in-house kind of ancient database system or accounting system to use something like that as the reference uh, could be a big leap, both technologically and politically, inside of many large companies. Yeah, I'd mm. say the, the database is definitely a big thing. Um, having a database that you can actually query and do analysis on um, is, is huge. And I, I don't know much about how Stellar stuff works yet, but I know you support something with Postgres, and you may be able to actually like query that and do things. This is the problem we have today at Coinbase, yeah. Yeah. is our data team <laughs> wants to look at the blockchain yeah. data and like match that up with our sort of internal accounting and make sure everything's like kosher. And we can't without building custom tooling that just takes all the data from the blockchain and, and pulls it into like a SQL database that they can actually use. Um, and then on top of that, with like, um, like sort of moving everything over, I think another big thing is sort of transaction fees, right? You have to be able to trust that this thing is going to be constant. Um, when you're in the world of Ethereum or Bitcoin or really any of the sort of popular chains today, um, the fees may change from out from under you with, with at no fault of your own. Somebody comes in with a new ICO, they come in with a new DAP, and all of a sudden the fees are you know, 10, 40 times more expensive. And that's not something you can use in this sort of public world. And so maybe private blockchains are one of the ways that you can do that um, to make that more of a consistent experience. Um, but that's another, I think, huge barrier to sort of adoption is you don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow. Um, and you have really no assurance of that. So a, a, just to be clear, though, a blockchain that has a SQL interface to it is a database. And it's just a cool database, right? <laughs> like oh. it's really cool, and it has a bunch of interesting benefits it's because a shared multi-master well, database, yeah. resilient to hostile actors, it, which is the novel part. That's fantastic, well, right? I mean, like, I mean that's all great. these are data. I mean, like Bitcoin's a database if you want to like go that far. I mean, yeah. I mean, that that that's yeah. what a Fortune 500 company, when they're not looking at it for fi for financial reasons, but are instead are looking at well, what are the benefits to a system like this, and w to a shared one, to a centralized, yeah. to a private model, they really are looking at 
what are the benefits of having an enhanced ledger where you get away from the many restrictions of a relational database that you can't understand and audit and do other things to. Um, but, but fundamentally, if you're in this room and you're trying to build a startup that's building for Fortune 500 companies and you're trying to think, how can I help them? Um, the way that they're going to approach you initially and actually pay you money is they're looking for something that's like a database but has a bunch of these benefits. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if that's you in this room, just remember that, like, this is a chance to make a better thing uh, that people understand a little bit um, and uh, do so in a way that they really understand a lot. Yeah. In five years, how will I yeah. spend a day of my life? I don't know. I, I feel like it'll be like robot holocaust. I don't, I don't know what it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a, a so, positive thought yeah, sentiment. Right. There. Yeah, yeah. Probably some fancy diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, one thing to that though, um, what we found interesting when we started to uh, deploy nodes and networks and trying to iterate around the infrastructure components and 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 uh, uh, orchestration services around blockchain is how early we still are. I mean, like there's just so many components missing in order to. Uh, build anything remotely um, consumer centric or you know anything that hits scale on a level that you're used to um, that uh, you know this is I mean from my perspective is not something it'll be five years before you see something even remotely relevant um, it's still very very early um, from from that level and that was interesting for us when we started block in last year is because we started just before the sort of boom and you know token prices and valuations where blockchain suddenly became the hottest subject because the valuations were so crazy. And uh, we started raising money with like, well, you know, infrastructure, scaling issues, all that type of stuff, which people really didn't want to hear at the time. And now it's a very popular subject. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we're doing better. But, uh, the, um, but it's been really interesting to kind of sort of also that dawn of understanding on how complex decentralized systems really are and uh, how much work it takes in order to shepherd um, open source communities to you know, have agree on consensus models and build tools that uh, you know, can live on a sort of a blockchain that with time becomes more and more and more complex. You know? So an interesting question would be, you know, how large do we think Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of those changes is in five years? You know? like, how do you do that? Um, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a phrase that I, I wrote once, uh, a mentor of both Brian and mine, Tim O'Reilly. I, I said to him, you become what you disrupt. And Tim likes to throw that back in my face every once in a while because uh, you know I've d I've done some industry disruption and then suddenly you find yourself in that model and so I feel like at the moment where we are is if we succeed and suddenly we see you know mass adoption be in in finance in a in a mainstream way if we see mass adoption by the by the you know major enterprises and they're using blockchain. Uh, what you're going to find is is that we, you you look like the entities that you disrupted, and so you know uh, if you've built something that uh, looks like a database, congratulations, you run a big database company, and uh, you know if and oh, it's got these other advantages, cool. So maybe you disrupted Amazon or Microsoft or Google uh, and their their cloud environment, so you just look just like them. And mm -hmm. so the the interesting thing is is that um, decentralization has a, a potential to change. Um, uh, to change that fabric in the same way that it did the first time when we launched and, and, and began to commercialize the internet. Um, and so what I, what I hope is, is that we see a wave of innovation um, and new services that emerge that five years from now look like what we started to see in the internet in you know, 99, uh, 2000, where it was like a whole new, true, amazing world. Mm. And uh, so that's what I'm, I'm looking for. But I do believe you become what you disrupt. Mm. But who said it better? Uh, Say hello to the new boss, same as the old boss. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah, and so uh, the a great question. And so on the public note, for us, it's more of a, a sort of aficionado product. Um, I do urge people. I like Bitcoin. Like I'm not, you know, nearly as savvy as any of these guys, but I do like the concept of easy node deployment and making it easy for nodes to be deployed and run. And I think that's very important for Bitcoin and Ethereum and any of the larger um, um, uh, public uh, networks. Uh, the use case very often is, you know, connect your own wallet to it, have a complete history of the ledger. You can run some query, you know, pull some data out of it. Um, but it's not something you need to do. You can, you know, go on Coinbase and have him worry about it. You know, so <laughs> I think the um, and so uh, the the use case on the private stuff is is the way we productize it. It's really a network management tool, and what that means is any protocol and project that has a native token that needs outside nodes to validate transactions. Uh, needs a system in order to make it easy for people to deploy a node and connect it because it is actually fairly tedious 
Uh, nodes are a little bit the gremlins of software. They tend to be all a little idiosyncratic based on the protocol and configuration. Um, and then, so, you know, just because you know how to do an Ethereum node doesn't mean that you know how to do a Stellar node or, or you know, any other type of node. So they're all uh, specific, and there's so many of them now that as a developer, you have no time educating yourself in all these different, uh, you know, kind of sort of very specific use cases you need in order to connect to a network. So customers of ours are companies like Aeon, for example, which is a more popular protocol where, um, you know, the Gold Network, which is a Quorum uh, version that we've just launched, actually we announced it today. Uh, these guys need um, outside people to run uh, transaction validation nodes that are banks and commodity traders, and they have no idea how to deploy a complex Quorum node. And so we have a white label product that they can use. They send these guys an invite. It takes them to a back end where there's a big gold button, and you just click that, and it deploys a node, and you can select the infrastructure of your choice, for example. And so that's sort of the thing where we make the most money with. Um, ultimately, I would urge everyone to, you know, I do feel that a node is sort of kind of your voice in the consensus mechanism. And I think on the larger networks, you know, it's kind of fun to run them. But, you know, obviously I'm biased and I like that stuff. But, yeah. And you'll bootstrap a network uh, uh, on a, uh, locally on, on Block Daemon mm. with the presumption that at some point the network will grow and there'll be nodes on that network on Absolutely. other infrastructure providers. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And, and like we work with everyone, like we're trying to be very open. Uh, we're trying to kind of open source our version of it where individual pro uh, protocols can actually add their own nodes to our service for people to deploy. So we don't even have to do that anymore. Mm. That'll be my dream. Um, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to answer like because it, I mean, good, you know, it really depends on the use case of the consensus that's needed, right? So there's, I mean, there's a lot of popular ones. Um, I think I haven't seen a blockchain where consensus is applied in a way that we maybe think of it. Like, even Bitcoin is fairly centralized in a lot of ways, if you think about it. Uh, so I don't have a good answer. I don't know. Do you have an answer there? Yeah, or? I mean, I think people just don't know how to govern any kind right. of thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what it down to. EOS. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, not even just like societies. Like we, it's like it's <laughs> governance is an open question, right? Still, so it, it, yeah. it's there's no easy answer. I don't think it's, yeah. it's going to ultimately boil down to personality politics. So there's a temptation so. in, in this space to try to say, can we automate these through having like rules around governance that we can encode in software? Things like if two thirds of the network agrees that there's a bad actor node that they can kick them out or something yeah, like that, just, right? But then uh, it's just a popularity contest yeah. and like, yeah. And then there's a risk yeah, yeah. That, like, that you set up a set of rules well, and somebody he, he figures out how to the game nodes, them. Right, right. <laughs> like, so, so he just well, changes the nodes. <laughs> the, but, well, but even the creation of rules, I and mean, we, were all, we were all nine years old once, right? You, somebody tells you a set of rules, your brain goes to how do I game those? How do I like hack those to my advantage, right? And so I think coming up with algorithmic rules, I mean like the prevention of double spend is a really cool thing, right? Like it's a great form of governance rule, right? That uh, there's probably other kind of logic that we can implement into a blockchain and make sure the right kinds of things happen and the wrong kinds of things don't. And the more that we can encode, the more um, less arbitrary that kind of enforcement can be, right? Uh, but at some point at the end, you need some human level of conversation between the people who are running the nodes, running the validators to say, um, should we evolve the rules in some way? Should we fix that bug that somebody used? And by the way, they exploited that bug and they stole assets from somebody else. We need to correct for that, right? And so some adjudication process, something that, I mean, you, you talk about DNS, right? ICANN gets a lot of hits for being kind of an awkward organization, but at least they have a transparent process for when somebody steals the domain name or somebody feels like, hey, you registered my trademark, there's a dispute process that everybody who's a domain name registrar had to agree to to have the right to register domain names, right? And so we'll probably see similar things in other types of blockchain networks out there where it's a lot of algorithmic, but, but small, some small little bit of adjudication process that the parties agree to uh, as humans to go and, and sort out kind of bugs or broken transactions. Mm. I mean, I think what you mentioned earlier is all, all, always the ultimate uh, like escape mechanism is that you can always just fork it, right? So, mm -hmm. like, if, if you ultimately like if you disagree strongly enough, then you can just create your own network. So, which is I think you can, but the network's effect is like so strong. I mean, you always For have sure. these core yeah. developers who you know you're here. They don't have that much power because you know you can run your own node or you can like not run their software, but when you're running nodes, you end up relying on them for specific things. You rely on specific APIs they yep. may offer or things like that. And if they implement a feature you don't like, yes, you can choose to not run it or you can fork it and run your own, but to actually have a network on that or to like change your infrastructure to be able to support that is like pretty powerful. So I think you can't get fully, you can't automate everything, which I don't think anybody said here yet, but like you can't automate who controls sort of the code and what goes in there because there will always be these sort of 
gatekeepers there and the people who implement it. And there's a lot of incentives for them to do the right thing. If they do the wrong thing, people aren't going to want to run their software. They might actually take the, that opportunity to switch. And so there is incentives there for them to do that, but mm. they do still have this power to control it. And if there's like a single node sort of implementation that most people run, they have a lot of power to sort of like push for the sure. network in the direction that they want to go, whether mm. or not people agree with it. Mm. I think Tezos has put the most amount of mature thinking into this kind of question too. Like how do you automate kind of protocol upgrades and get consensus by the node operators on the right kinds of upgrades to do? Mm. Uh, uh, so I, I, I hope- Not on the legal governance, Maybe not so much but on yeah. that, yeah. Um, All right. A massive increase in the cost per watt. Right, okay. Yeah, I would say like regulatory concerns are probably like would mm. be the most hampering effect, I think. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, I think major major bugs in some of major like money losing bugs in some of these implementations are like massive chain splits that cause just havoc on sort of the yeah. world of cryptocurrency, and it's just going to call the entire sort of security and trust of it into question if that happens. Hmm. Does anyone remember the last crypto wars in the late '90s when like it was officially illegal to export arbitrary uh, encryption? Mm technology of arbitrary key length like we used to have rules that pretended that this was a big secret public key crypto right uh, uh, and I, I'm worried that the kinds of things that would set this back would be a trade war leading to people not able to travel to conferences or not able to collaborate across certain uh, geographic boundaries uh, I'd worry about uh, pissing our allies off I'd worry about oh wait uh, uh, there's a lot of that <laughs> happening now um, <laughs> uh, before I go down that path yeah, yeah. I think it's it's macro issues Hmm. not technology yeah. issues that I think uh, put a lot of this at risk. Yeah, I think a mixture of that or Jake getting drunk and hitting the wrong button and Coinbase <laughs> <laughs> sort of... <laughs> uh, publishing yeah. the keys to WikiLeaks. That's right, yeah, yeah. something like that. We have a slightly different take, which is the reason why no one can run a mail server on their own anymore is spam, right? Spam made it too expensive to run mail filters, so I'm filtering on the inbound, but it also uh, set a whole large part of the IP address space out there as blacklisted, you couldn't send mail from because it was assumed that uh, ISPs, right? If you were sending mail from a from your uh, a home uh, internet connection, that you were probably a spammer, right? Uh, I, I, I run my own mail server, but I've had the same IP address for 20 years, uh, so it's been whitelisted everywhere. Um, uh, but uh, but it'd be really hard now to run it from my home, um, uh, and I think that. The, the funny tie to, to blockchain is proof of work actually came from an anti-spam proposal, which was uh, that to stop the spammers by sending a challenge that they would have to solve, whether it's like refactoring or reversing a hash or something like that, um, to try to slow them down so it got too expensive to send. The conclusion being email failed because it was too cheap. That it was you know, uh, uh, zero cost to send email, so everybody did for everything, and that just swamped the system. And that's unfortunate, and it's possible that Public cryptocurrency like like uh, approaches might help uh, mitigate that. Like might provide an economic model now for being able to accept messaging again that can't be so easily DDoSed. But it would be really tragic, in my opinion, to go back to a world where you had to spend a little bit of money to send an email. Because I started before I got on the internet, I was on Prodigy, where it cost 25 cents to send a 280 character email message to somebody else. And I'm really glad we got off that. So I don't I hope we don't like. Isn't that what blockchains are doing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of. Right, <laughs> kind of. Like, it's well, a little public bit. ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say one thing we just being up here is helpful because outside of, you know, this world, everybody's like, oh, it's all it's all criminals. It's all terrorists. And just being up here and showing, you know, oh, we're trying to actually do good things. We're not actually those people that in itself is helpful to sort of push it forward and bring it more mainstream so that people it's something that people want. And if it's something people want, it's harder to take it away. They still can, but it's going to be harder. Uh, and I think that's that's just one thing that we can do is a very small thing. Yeah. Is there a specific regulation? Like, what's the? Is there a specific one? No, I mean, not really. I mean, I would, I, I would echo this sentiment that, that basically, like, I think it, the, the sooner this stuff can be used widely in the world, that, that it will make it much, much harder for to be regulated, and it, it, because obviously it is being used by some stuff that regulators want to stop, or like, you know, like they probably want to stop these really scammy ICOs and stuff. Like, and so, if that becomes a totality of what this space is about, then yes, it's going to be they're going to put the kibosh on it. So you really want like legitimate use to like. So it can have even greater legitimate use in the future, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah.